All right, thanks for hanging around for the last session of the day. Uh, I am John Taki. I am from Otaru University of Commerce in Japan. Um, one of the things that I do is materials development, uh, textbook writing, and I was very interested in the previous presentation and uh, thinking about how I deal with textbooks, um, being the uh, white middle-aged American that I think she was talking about. Uh, I've been doing textbooks for a long time, and I, I went to a conference in March in Bangkok. Can you hear me okay? Can we hear me okay? Yeah, come a little forward if you can't hear me. Yeah. Right. And uh, I went to a conference in Bangkok in March, and I was talking about the teacher training program that I do at my university in Otaru, where I train graduate students who are young teachers uh, the skills of materials development so that they can uh, learn materials development, curriculum design through the creation of a textbook. And uh, this is a pretty novel thing because I'm taking young, young teachers and I'm taking them in 16 weeks from, I don't know anything about curriculum design or materials development, all the way through to a finished manuscript that we sent off to publishers and we've uh, published two of them so far. One with Cengage and one with a Japanese publisher named um, Kinzeo. But I found that in Bangkok that the audience had come not so much to hear about the teacher trainees learning to write books, but they wanted to know themselves how to write a textbook. And that's where this presentation developed from. So I just want to go through the basics today of the two parts of um, textbook design from the beginning to publication. The first part is uh, from idea to manuscript, and the second part is from manuscript to publication. Okay. Um, what can we say about textbook design? Well, the first thing that we have to understand is that textbook design is very rigid. Okay? Uh, do you remember back to your writing classes and the writing classes you teach? We teach students how to outline, right? Okay? The key to a good textbook or it's a, the key to any good piece of writing, uh, any book that you're going to write, is going to be to have a good outline, right? And we teach our students basic outlines, design, you know, for each chapter. We start introduction, body, conclusion, just like we always do. But we have to start to break this apart into bigger and bigger parts, break it down into levels so that we can see what it is that we're trying to do. The best piece of advice I can give to anyone who wants to write a textbook or any kind of book at all is don't start the thing until you can see the other side until you can see the end of what you're doing. All right? It all starts with an idea. Right? You've got this idea for this book. I've never seen a book like this. I think it would be a good book. I think a lot of people would be interested in it. I think the students would benefit from it. And I think it would be marketable. What do I do with it? Okay, and this is the question I get. People send me email every once in a while after they see me at a conference and they'll say, I've got this idea, now what? Okay? You take the idea and you start to figure out what is it that I'm trying to achieve, okay? What are the skills I want to teach? What is the audience I'm going to be addressing, okay? And what is the level that this is going to go with? Is it going to be, for example, a whole language text? Is it going to be an individual skill you're focusing on? Is it going to be content-based, okay? Um, I like to do the content-based books sometimes. Uh, I have a background in linguistics, so sometimes I take those topics and turn them into books. Um, so you've got all this stuff going around in your head. And what I like to recommend to my learners, uh, to the students that I train to do this as well, is you don't only have to understand what it is that you think the book is going to do. You have to try to anticipate how the audience is going to respond to that. And you have to anticipate the market. Is there a market for it? If you're going to eventually take it to publication. Now, we do a lot of great stuff in our classes, and that provides a lot of material that can be used for a textbook. If you created this wonderful class, you've probably already got the material in order to create a textbook. You just have to put it together and figure out how it works. In a one semester textbook, how many 
chapters or lessons are there usually in a one semester textbook? 15 would be a good number. Most of the one semester texts I do have 15 lessons in them. What about a year long text? Slightly less common, but we still see them around. How many lessons are usually in a year long text? A year is not really a semester. Yes, two semesters. Nope. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. How many in a one semester text? It's actually a smaller number. It's actually around 21 to 24. Okay. Usually, in a, a one-year text, you get 21 to 24. Why is that? I never completed the whole chapter. Because nobody completes the textbook. Because often, especially if you're doing a year-long course, you're probably going to put a project or two somewhere in there. It's probably going to take two or three weeks. You might have a midterm exam. You might have a final exam. That'll kill off another two weeks uh, if you're doing prep or something like that. So now we're down to about 24. So usually when I'm writing a year-long text, I'm looking at 21 to 24 chapters. 15 on a semester course because we want to give the teachers more of a selection. So that they can either use the book entirely straight from beginning to end, or they can pick and choose chapters if they want to have a midterm, if they want to have a project in 15 weeks. So then they can sort of pick and choose. Now, one of the problems that we often get into is that when we're starting to brainstorm and we're starting to think about these subject headings for each chapter, the topics that are going to be included in the text, is that we have this great idea for a text, but we can't come up with 15 or 21 or 24 individual lessons. Either. Okay? And this has happened quite a lot. Okay? So we get this great idea, but we can't come up with enough lessons for it. What do we do? All right? As I try to tell my graduate students who are becoming teachers, when you get to that point, you have to stop. Don't do this unless you can see it from beginning to end. If you can organize it out and you can outline out 15 individual lessons, you're fine. You're ready to go. But if you can't, if you can only come up with 10, and the other five don't either don't look right or don't feel right, or they're not going to be that interesting to the students, then you have to slow down and you have to move on to something else, try something different. Now, I'm going kind of fast today, I'm sorry about that, but which is more important? Which one should you pay more attention to? The subject of each chapter, each lesson. Oh. Hello. Hello, I've come on in. Sorry. The subject of each lesson or the content of each of those lessons? Which one should you be paying attention to? Okay, well, as I said, if we have 15 lessons in the book, all right, we have 15 individual lessons. When we're doing the brainstorming out for each of the lessons, um, we don't actually start working on this thing until we know what each of them are going to be. But what I would like to um, argue is that the content of each of those individual lessons is going to be extremely important, especially in the later stages as you're moving from manuscript to publication. And the reason is because if, and I'll mention this again later, if the publisher wants to change a couple of the lessons in the book, that's not a big deal change one or two of the lessons is not a big deal. It is a big deal if content, the content of each chapter, each lesson has to change. If they say, all right, we like your, um, your warm-up activity, your main topic is good, but everything after that has to be changed, you have to change it in multiples. You're going to change it 15 times, or you're going to change it 21 times, or 24 times, depending on how many lessons are in the book. So it's crucial that before you're writing the manuscript, you have it clear what each of those activities is going to be. All right? And the average textbook, how many activities are in each lesson? Do you ever count them? OK, in uh, the, the textbooks that I work with most often are Japanese textbooks, Japanese textbook publishers. Okay, the average textbook that we're designing is going to be five to seven activities. It's built for a 50-minute course or a 90-minute course. 
and you're going to have um, probably some type of warm-up, or if it's a reading text, a pre-reading activity, some type of uh, thing up there. Uh, you're going to have the uh, main uh, reading or the main activity. Some type of follow-up questions, probably. Or uh, your, if it's not a main reading, you might have um, two or three opinions that the students are going to argue. Uh, whatever the focus of each of those lessons is going to be a follow-up, a couple of their activities, and uh, some type of uh, activity to bring it to a close. And as I mentioned to you uh, at the beginning, this is a, a pretty rigid thing. It's going to not vary very much between individual lessons. Okay. The only variation that I found in Japan is usually down to the last activity, where the publisher will give me some flexibility to change activities between lessons. Otherwise, uh, what we're going to get is the same thing repeated 15 times uh, with a different thing here. Okay. So, You've taken the idea, you've brainstormed it out, you've got 15 different lessons, you've spent your time organizing out each of the activities, so you know what you're going to do in the warm-up for each lesson, you know what you're going to do in the main activity, you know who your audience is, you know what level it is, all the things we talked about earlier. Then what? Okay. It seems like a big task. It's not that big. Because once you've got this down, and actually as you get into this process of materials development, as you start working with publishers, um, you'll actually be talking more and more with them as you're developing the books. But in the beginning, when you're doing your first book, you're doing this kind of cold. And you're hoping to get it right the first time. Okay, so you've got your chapter organized out, and then it's time to actually start writing these lessons. If you haven't already done so, and as I said, many of the textbooks that uh, come out are based on what goes on in, in a professor's course, a teacher's course. And they're taking those materials and saying, this works, well, I think this might work more widely. So you may already have this information. But if not, then it's time to actually start writing the lessons, preparing the manuscript. And one of the questions that I often get asked is, when do, I, when do I actually take this to the publisher? When do I actually show this to the publisher? Okay. Um, and I've recommended to people that if it's your first textbook, it's good to have a full manuscript ready. If, this is, if you've done this before and the publisher is familiar with you, you may be able to get away with a few chapters and the... Um, uh, the, the argument for why this book is necessary for the market, what it's good for, and that becomes a little bit easier. But in the beginning, having the entire manuscript available, which means writing the entire manuscript and taking a chance a little bit. So, when we actually move from the entire, having the manuscript finished to trying to approach a publisher, what do we do then? This is where we start getting into a little bit of a question. What do we do after we've got the manuscript? How do we get it to the publisher? Okay, it's a couple different ways of doing this. Um, the most common way that people tend to do it is they tend to send it off to the publisher. Okay, and at least working in Japan, most of the publishers are not so large that if you sent off a manuscript cold that they wouldn't get it into the right hands uh, for someone to look at. But there are two other ways of getting your manuscript into the hands of the publisher that actually are quite successful. And they, and they mostly involve the publishers coming to you. Okay. For example, we have the publisher's tables downstairs, right? Okay. The publishers, the book reps that are downstairs, they know who the contact person is for the publishers. Um, I have been known to show up to a conference with a manuscript in hand 
to talk to the publisher's reps and say, listen, when are you going back to, in my case, when are you going back to Tokyo? Could you take this back for me? And this is what it's about. And spend a little time explaining to them what it's about. And that's been quite successful. But the other way is when the publisher's reps actually come to your school. Okay? They're coming to your school to sell you textbooks. I'm encouraging them to come to my office so that I can send them back to the manuscript. Okay? I used to hate the publishers coming to my office. All right, oh, another publisher, another stack of sample books. But I actually like the sample books now because I can see what everyone else is doing. Okay? And I can see whether that idea that I have, how it compares to what other people are doing, what is missing from the marketplace in the areas that I'm looking at. And the publishers now know when they come to my office they can expect something, or at least a discussion about what I'm working on. All right? And where I live in Hokkaido, it's far from Tokyo, all right? It's 800 miles north, all right? Sort of out of sight, out of mind. So how do I stay current with everything that's going on? Well, I encourage the publishers to come up. When they do, they come up and they see me, we talk, and uh, I start looking for what they're interested in, what the market is interested in, and we try to talk about some possible ideas for that. And uh, it's, it's tended to work out quite well. So, when we uh, are trying to get our book, our manuscript, published, we have to take advantage of these opportunities that we have for this. And that means um, attending conferences. It means getting all the sample books we can get. It means learning the market and learning the audience. Okay, for example, about 70% of the, of the uh, university level textbooks published in Japan are aimed at what level? Well, college, of course, but first, first year. <laughs> first, year sec first, year, first year, second year. All right? So that's always uh, going to be the, the easiest way to get into the market. Okay? So if you've got a manuscript and you're starting to develop it, and for example, you're aiming at third or fourth year at a more advanced level, you're going to have a harder time getting it in. Okay? But if you're aiming where the majority of the textbooks go, and this is not to say in any way that this is right or wrong. This is just accepting the way that the market is currently functioning. Um, you have to aim at that first and second year level. Okay? And you're always trying to look for that thing that's going to be slightly different. That new activity. And it's very difficult because the publishers will fight against this actually. Every time I try to put something new that hasn't been seen in the system before, um, even flesh Kincaid reading levels, we try to put into one of our textbooks, we, we fought a lot of resistance from the publishers. What are these? Why do you want to put this in? Our teacher is going to understand this on the other side. Okay. But um, my argument has always been, there, there's a textbook, there's a book in every, every one of us as teachers. We just have to find what it is. And a lot of people want to have this opportunity. And so that's kind of why I came today, was to sort of talk about that. But I've got just a couple minutes left, so I want to open it up for questions. I realize I've gone extremely fast today, and I apologize for that. But uh, let me open it up for questions. We have here Aksani from Um, I want to ask you what is the, like, maybe that one is your um, uh, experience, based on your experience, what is the most enjoyable moment or process or step yeah, during publishing in, a in textbook? Writing it? Yeah. And also, like, what, what is the most challenging part? Uh, challenging or frustrating? Oh, well, a few. <laughs> no, uh, for, for me, the most exciting part of it is when, the, when I get that idea. When, when I'm working on something and suddenly it springs this idea into my head and this would be really, really good. And not so much good in an economic sense or any, any of that because publishing always has that marketing side to it. But 
in the sense of, I think this book would be really good. And let me give you an example. Uh, my background was, was in linguistics, PhD in linguistics. Uh, but I also did apply it along the way. And one of the first textbooks I did was a book called, um, was originally called Linguistics in the Real World. And I wanted to take linguistic theories, principles, and I wanted to show how they, they work in real life. And the book was called Linguistics in the Real World. It bombed. It didn't bomb when it got published. It bombed by, because the title the publishers thought was too complex. Okay? I changed the topic after seven rejections. Seven Japanese publishers rejected the manuscript. I changed the title to Language in Our World. The eighth publisher took it. It's in ninth printing. Okay? It's been a very successful niche market content-based uh, textbook for first and second year university students. And because there are so many Japanese English teachers who have that linguistics background, they really liked being able to use that kind of book to get that information passed on to their students. Um, the biggest frustration for me, uh, I think, is innovation and trying to always be innovative and always finding resistance from the Japanese publishers. Um, well, this hasn't been done before. We don't because they're backing it with money, okay, in the publication process. So they want something that's uniform and. That goes along with also trying to fight against some of the philosophical things that you know are correct, which you have to compromise on because of the nature of this, the system you're working in. In Japan, of course, it's usually about the use of the Japanese language and how much Japanese we should be using in the textbook versus how much English. And that's a bit of frustration, but it's, it's something that we have to work on and we have to negotiate with the publishers and we have to try to do the best we can. Yeah. Can this walk in? Five minutes, so I missed the whole presentation. But I got what you said, you, you mentioned about uh, the market target. Um, yeah. uh, your writing is the college uh, freshman and sophomore? Well, that, that's the biggest uh, market in Japan right now. And the reason it's the biggest market in Japan is because we're usually not allowed to work at the lower levels because everything below the university level is really directly under the control of the Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. where you have to get the textbooks approved by the ministry, which means forming a committee rather than working as an individual author or co-author. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a big nuisance. It really is a, a huge nuisance. My so is, we sorry. work at a higher level. Yeah. So for, uh, for your market, you're mainly focused on the Japanese market or you're focusing on Asian? And do you put well, into this big Asian cultures that are different from countries? Well, there, there are two Japanese questions countries. there. Um, I work indirectly in the other countries. I have one book in Korea right now, three books in Taiwan. Um, and those, have, those are basically licenses off of the original Japanese text. Okay? So we didn't really do anything. They were just translated into Korean or translated into um, uh, Chinese. And the second question was about culture. I was about the Asian cultures, yeah. different countries, like uh, you're talking the biggest market, like North sure. China, Korea, and Japan. Yeah. Um, as the FL students, mm -hmm. because the culture different, because the first language difference, so sure. when you design textbooks, probably put this into consideration. That and and we do. Um, I have a very good co-author that I've been working with, and he really brought me into the publishing system. He had already done about 40 textbooks before I had come aboard at Otara University of Commerce. And since then, we've done about 25 or 30 together. And um, we try to design the textbooks. And when we're, we have the idea, we'll sit down and we'll start talking about the idea. And do we want to market this specifically to Japan, or do we want to open it up to Asia? And in some cases, we do. We have books that are, that are culturally based, which are directly on um, America, Japan, and things like that. Not so much in the sense of what our previous speaker was talking about. But um, American uh, culture through Japanese eyes, for example. But we often will take um, a set of topics that could be broadly uh, used throughout Asia, and we'll try to create a textbook that way as well. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I got to run to the closing ceremony. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. One thing I wanted to add was, yeah. in case you just may not know. The reason that you, you go for the, the lower levels, the first mm -hmm. and second year college, 
is that's where they sell the most books, and they're in there for the money. Yeah. So that's why they do it. I see. Yeah. It's kind of discouraging, but it's the bottom line for the publishers it is, is it money. Is. So I was guessing because yeah. you know you have this this amount of first and second year students. They're going to go up to third and fourth, and where they don't care. Well, yeah, at, at that stage, I mean, yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Professor Day. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Good to see you. I'll see you in yes. April. In March or April. March or April. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, the uh, the advanced levels. If you're doing your first textbook, I'd encourage you to focus on first and second year. But once you've done a few of them, you can propose third or fourth year books because the publishers will take them. Because you have that background and you have that experience to write the book the way that they want it. Okay? So don't let that discourage you. But my point today was if you're doing your first textbook, aim at wherever you have the biggest chance of getting in first and second year. I should probably wrap this up because I think everybody wants to go to the closing ceremony. So thank you.